So Greedfall is a video game that I've been looking forward to for a while now. I've been rather disillusioned by, you know, Bioware and companies like that who have output RPGs that leave a lot to be desired. So when I saw Greedfall, when I saw its trailers and what it was going for, I was thoroughly compelled from the outset. And after having played for about 20 hours or so, I'm not done with the game, so I'm not going to call this a full-fledged review. But after playing for 20 hours, I can definitely say that this game does fill that void Bioware left behind in a lot of ways. It is rough around the edges, so it's not a perfect game, it has a lot of flaws. But there is a diamond in the rough, and it takes clearly a lot of inspiration from titles like Witcher, as well as Bioware games like Dragon Age and Mass Effect, but at the same time, it does feel like it has its own identity. So, Greedfall, from a narrative perspective, the synopsis is basically that your nation, Serene, is plagued by this disease called the Malachor. So you, as the legate of the Congregation of Merchants, you're tasked with going to the island of Tirfredi, which is now being colonized by various factions. Your goal is to go there and find a cure. That's kind of the core of the story, the basic setup. But along the way, there are plenty of factions you'll stumble upon. There's the religious group Teleme, there's the more scientific-based group, the Bridge Alliance, there's the natives of Tear for D, who are basically these tribal druids, there's the Knots, which is a sailor faction, so on and so forth, and then there is your own faction, the Congregation of Merchants, that's kind of in between all of these factions' diverging agendas, their conflicting agendas. And it's really interesting to see all of this political intrigue play out. It's definitely the strongest aspect of this game. The narrative will keep you hooked. I love the way all of these different factions are kind of either plotting against each other or kind of you can tell that there's conflict brewing. And especially with the natives who just want to be left alone, but with these different factions colonizing the island that brews its own set of conflicts and how that all plays out is without question a really compelling aspect of this title but beyond that you know you're gonna experience individual storylines based on the side quests that you'll partake in here and there and also there will be plenty of companions whose storylines you can delve into as you talk to them and do quests that are unique to them and it all paves the way for a narrative that has kept me hooked for 20 hours and that I really do want to delve back into and see where it all leads to. There's also plenty of mystery surrounding the island itself and, you know, the agendas of your own faction, the Congregation of Merchants. There's just a lot of political intrigue and mysteries and some plot twists here and there that has all kind of made me invested in the story at hand. And I should also add that every quest in this game feels like there is some narrative there. You know, there's plenty of games out there whose side quests feel like padding, you know, fetch quests and what have you. And here, although there are, I'd say, fewer quests than you might find in a larger RPG, I'd rather have quality over quantity. And each quest I've delved into so far, while there's definitely varying degrees of scale in terms of how big some of these quests are. They all have some kind of narrative hook. They all lead to some kind of narrative intrigue towards the end. It's Witcher-esque in that way. That's a game where all the side quests had some kind of storyline that you could feel kind of invested in. Greedfall follows in that path. And as you do these quests, you'll of course engage in conversation with a wide array of NPCs. And I feel like for the most part, the dialogue does feel meaningful, especially in the choices that you make. There is a lot of dialogue choices that delve into exposition in terms of telling you more about the world and the lore at hand, and all of that is very informative. And alongside that, during quests and what have you, there will be times when you'll be making dialogue choices that will have effects on certain characters' fates. Furthermore, there is a reputation system for individual characters as well as for the various factions in the game and there will be times when certain dialogue options will affect your disposition and reputation with them. I will say this though, in the 20 hours that I've played I have yet to see the reputation system 
have any kind of narrative effect. I feel like this is something that I'll see maybe as I delve into the end game or as I dive deeper into the campaign. But so far, I haven't seen the reputation system play out. I've seen pluses and minuses. I've seen the numbers pop up on screen, but I haven't seen the effects that they actually have in the world. And I wish that stuff was more readily apparent more evenly distributed throughout the experience. It feels like they're leaving a lot of the effects and a lot of the consequences of how the reputation system is designed more towards like the latter end of the game, which is a bit disappointing. But again, I haven't finished the game, so I don't know how it will all play out. Maybe it will lead to something really great that'll make up for the fact that the reputation system isn't super prominent, or maybe it just won't lead to anything. Now, it isn't just in dialogue where you'll get to make choices. Plenty of quests will allow you to tackle it in multiple ways. So you can just go in guns blazing, kill everyone, take what you want. You can also take a stealthy approach, and stealth in this game isn't the best. The AI is pretty dumb and the stealth system isn't super fleshed out, but there are cool elements like being able to disguise yourself using a faction's armor to go into a restricted zone safely and stuff like that. And there is a satisfaction in being able to backstab someone and kill them instantly. This is also something you can employ in the open world when you encounter certain creatures. There's this one time where I encountered a sort of a slightly stronger creature than usual, and I could have taken the creature out by just fighting them one on one, but I decided to just sneak behind them and sneak attack them just for the fun of it, and it was kind of satisfying, but definitely not the most fleshed out stealth system. You can't hide in grass or anything like that. So there's guns blazing, there's stealth, and you can also do things like charm people, use persuasion along the way, and persuasion was one of the talents that I deeply invested in, which I'll dive into later. Furthermore, in quests, you can find a variety of shortcuts and different methods that you can take based on the talents that you invested in. So if you're really good at lock picking, you might be able to free someone who's in a jail cell without having to find the key. Or if you have enough figure, you might be able to climb certain structures or jump across certain structures and skip a huge portion of the quest or kind of take a shortcut and not have to go through kind of uh, this longer route. Or if you invest in enough science points, you might be able to occasionally spot these weak walls that you can kind of take down and find a shortcut that way. So there's plenty of outlets like that. I think a couple quests, there are elements of being able to take these sleeping pills and put them inside wine and have NPCs drink that so that they fall asleep and you can go in stealthily and take whatever you want. So there's a variety of elements like that that I think add a, a level of depth to some of these quests that make you feel a, a greater degree of agency. And depending on what paths you take, how you decide to do certain quests, you might make your life easier in certain quests or there may be more or less casualties. Furthermore, which characters you bring to certain quests does have a tangible impact in terms of some of the conversations that you have. So I always bring Siora along. She is the native companion. When you're in Tier for D, you're going to meet a lot of natives. So Siora is constantly chiming in with knowledge and insight. She'll sometimes interrupt conversation to help myself and the natives have a conversation and kind of try to calm things down when things get heated between the two sides. There's always interesting conversation with Siora, so I try to bring her along as much as I can. Other characters will chime in as well, depending on the situation, so that's also another great element. The one thing I'll say is that based on the 20 hours I've played, there haven't been much in terms of long-term ramifications. You get to make a lot of moment-to-moment -moment choices and quests that affect the quest itself, but I haven't yet seen a situation where the outcome of a quest affects something down the line in the future, a future quest in the campaign. I haven't seen like an NPC that I've rescued pop up later to thank you or anything like that. And I don't know if that'll crop up deeper into the game, maybe 10 hours further in or something, or if that just isn't as prominently present as some other RPGs out there. Now there is romance in this game, so that's good, at least from what I understand. I haven't delved into romance yet, but from other previews I've read, there is romance options. So that's, I think, a quintessential element of any RPG. It's good to know that that's there. Now on top of the story, the game also shines in a lot of ways when it comes to the world its expansiveness. It is truly a sight to behold, whether you're delving into Victorian towns and cities, 
in Serene or New Serene in the island of Tier for D, whether you're delving into the more Arabian inspired towns and cities from the Bridge Alliance, or whether you're kind of exploring the island itself and walking around the native settlements. There were plenty of moments in which I just kind of stopped and rotated the camera to bask it all in. Some of the vistas and scenes are truly gorgeous to look at. There are plenty of lush jungles and forests and ruins to act as visual eye candy as well. At the same time though, unfortunately, a lot of the towns and cities do feel empty. They lack big crowds and stuff like that. You'll see the occasional NPC walking around or the occasional inhabitant engaging in some kind of awkward animation loop. And I'll also say that while there is a unique visual flair to each faction's town or settlement, they are all basically structured exactly the same, particularly the colonial towns. There is a residence or a house that's yours in each town that you can rest in and there you can also manage your companions and equipment and fast travel. There's usually some kind of blacksmith, there are a couple merchants and there's like a governor's palace. Native settlements do add some variety on that front. They look more distinct. They don't have blacksmiths or your own residence. But more disappointing, I think, are the interiors, which are extremely lackluster. A lot of copying and pasting going on. A lot of houses, the interiors are structured exactly the same. You walk in the door and it's just uh, the exact same furniture, the exact same placement of doors and stairs, so on and so forth. This is especially noticeable with governor's palaces for each of the factions. So there's Tuleme, the Bridge Alliance, and the Congregation of Merchants. Each of those governor's palaces are literally exactly the same, save for like a few color schemes here and there. Like literally the exact same architecture. It's very noticeable and it's it kind of takes you out because you expect each faction to have their own way of building their edifices and structures. And then when you delve deeper into these governor's palaces you see a lot of the same like paintings it's kind of weird looking and out of place and you'll even see groups of awkwardly placed npcs engaging in idle animations pretending like they're talking you'll see the same group of npcs within the same room that definitely feels kind of lazy and it really took me out so a lot of copying and pasting going on, a lot of shortcuts taken on a technical standpoint. There's a level of like craftsmanship that's lacking on this front, which is unfortunate to see. There was also this one NPC who's part of a quest. Turns out that character model is a copy of one of the pedestrians that I stumbled upon at one point in the game, literally like seconds after the quest was over. So stuff like that just, uh, it kind of breaks the illusion quite a bit. But with all that said, in terms of the exteriors, when you're walking around the open world, when you zoom out, the game really is breathtaking. There's a lot of cool environmental details, a lot of just great artistic design. Now, I did notice there is no dynamic weather, which is unfortunate. I never once saw like rain or snow or a storm, anything of the sort. Didn't see tree swaying, kind of like they do in Witcher 3. Nothing of that nature. Though there is a day and night cycle that does help add a bit of variety to the environmental detail. But when you get up close and personal, you start to notice that the engine is not aging very well. The graphics aren't the best. They leave a lot to be desired when you look at things up front and personal. I find that textures tend to be muddy. Character models are never all that impressive. They actually look pretty last generation. And anytime you just zoom in, and look at things in detail, there is definitely a lackluster element to the technical aspects of this game. Now, sometimes with the right lighting, some characters actually do look pretty good during conversations and such, but for the most part, you can just see that this is a dated engine, and I hope this is something they can upgrade down the line. It doesn't help that a lot of characters look pretty damn ugly more often than not, there's just something about the coloring and the texturing that's off. And because the lighting engine in this game isn't all that impressive, that doesn't help matters either. I also find that presentation as a whole is generally a mixed bag. There are some cutscenes that are truly well made and have a lot of cool animations behind them, but then there are other times, especially during dialogue, when there are these awkward transitions that kind of really take me out that I wish they could have fleshed out better. Yes, no, I, you don't have the right. Damnation. He got away. 
facial animation is especially bad. There's some really bad lip syncing going on constantly. I have come to inform you that my cousin Constantine and I are departing for Tier for D on the hour. The teeth are super prominent. They're just really off-putting. And plenty of times you can see lips like twitching during cutscenes. And then there are bugs and glitches where occasionally objects are invisible and hair will disappear in the middle of cutscenes for no reason. Now, voice acting is generally pretty good, I find. Never like stellar or mind-blowing, but gets the job done. There are some lines that are delivered in a stilted manner, especially by the main character or certain minor NPCs. Justice cannot wait. I'm ready to fight. You shouldn't be here. This time, you won't get away with it. Tom's! But there are other times in which the main character has some really good dialogue with some good acting behind it. And there's a lot of good material when it comes to the companion characters. I find they have the strongest performances and the better lines and the better written dialogue. Now, despite the presentation being a mixed bag, the game's performance, I will say, is pretty rock solid. I play the game on PC with a 1080 Ti and it ran at a constant 60 frames per second at 1080p. Settings all maxed out. There weren't really any crashes or anything game-breaking. Everything ran smoothly, but graphics on a technical level overall are not up there. However, the art design in this game is, I would say, stellar. The soundtrack in this game definitely deserves commendation, really kind of glues the presentation together, adds an extra layer to the Victorian vibe or the native tribal druidic vibe. Whichever setting you're in, there is music for it that's really cool to listen to and that kind of keeps you hooked and immersed. There's just a world there that's incredibly compelling to look at. I love the design of the natives. I love the look and feel of everything in this game from an artistic standpoint. I think on a pre-production level, they really fleshed out the kind of world they wanted to make. And there's a clear vision for this world, even if the technical elements don't fully allow that aspect to shine as much as it could. And a lot of that you'll see as you bask in the open world, which is not seamless, there are like a dozen or so segments. It's more like Witcher 2 than Witcher 3. It's more of a collection of small sandboxes rather than a handful of big, large, seamless open worlds. A lot of these areas also tend to have kind of specific roads and paths and trails you are led to. You can't like climb any mountain or anything like that. There are a lot of invisible walls that prevent you from going to certain places, but they do feel open enough where there is enough of a sense of exploration. There are a couple ways you can traverse this world. You can either walk or you can use things like caravans, camps, your house and residence, and these various checkpoints in order to fast travel. And as you explore the world, you'll also find campsites. You can set up camp and that acts as a new checkpoint where you can rest up, re-equip your character, you can choose your companions in your camps, but also those camps scattered throughout the world act as fast travel checkpoints that are really convenient. So you want to definitely explore those. Now, when you aren't in a town or in a camp area, when you're exploring the world, beyond the campsites that you'll stumble upon, you'll also find things like skill altars that grant you extra skill points. You'll find crafting materials like plants and ores. You may also find some crates and boxes and chests with loot in them that come with things like potions and ammo and various resources. What you won't stumble upon, however, which is unfortunate, are off-the-cuff events and quests in the open world. You'll find some side quests here and there in towns and cities, but in the open world, it's all relatively empty. It's just about finding crafting materials or skill altars or campsites. Nothing dynamic happens while you're traversing the open exterior. From time to time, you might stumble upon groups of enemies, though, and they could be anything from hostile natives to bandits to maybe beasts and creatures that are unique to the island of Tier for D. Now there's some really cool creature designs here, but unfortunately there is a lack of enemy variety in this game. I found that there's maybe like five common enemy types that you basically fight over 
and over again and which enemies you fight depends on the region that you're in so there's like a bear looking creature this wyvern looking creature there's this armor cheetah looking creature there's a bull looking creature and then there's the soldiers and bandits and natives and that's pretty much it and there is occasional visual variations between each creature or enemy type like you'll occasionally find a different colored bear looking creature that's a little stronger than your typical bear looking creature or you'll find soldiers donning different armor depending on which faction they belong to but in terms of unique attack animations and stuff like that there's about five varieties that i've stumbled upon so far in terms of common enemies but there are occasional like boss battles in the form of guardians that inhabit tier for D, those are definitely a lot more compelling. On top of having really cool and unique creature design, they also have like unique movesets and a couple of these what I'd call boss battles can be pretty challenging. I got my ass kicked by one or two a couple times and yeah, those are I think more compelling. I just wish they were more prevalent. I wish these kinds of battles cropped up more often throughout my time with this game. But when they do pop up, they're definitely some of the more compelling combat scenarios. Speaking of combat, there's no denying that there is a lot of inspiration from The Witcher. It's overall a lot of fun. You have to be very deliberate with your attacks. Each attack has like an animation that has to play out before it strikes the enemy. So you don't want to button mash, you want to try to kind of poke and prod and uh, look at enemies' attacks and try to parry or dodge out of the way whenever you can. Button mashing is not gonna get you anywhere unless you're fighting like weaker enemies after you're, you've leveled up. The combat here definitely doesn't feel quite as tight or refined as The Witcher 3, but it's pretty good overall. You're gonna be making use of sword, magic, gun, and traps. Those are kind of the four pillars of combat. Sword is pretty basic, it's what you'd expect, it again feels like Witcher, you attack, dodge, or parry, and you can also occasionally use Fury Attacks, that has its own meter that builds up as you attack enemies, and those Fury Attacks deal greater damage or they can stun enemies, so you want to be on the lookout for opportunities to issue Fury Attacks when you're in precarious situations. Also worth considering is that enemies have armor, so you have to take armor down before you can inflict effects like stunning them or knocking them on their asses and in order to deal the full extent of damage that your weapon can deal. I do wish overall that the physical attacks with swords and such felt more impactful. I do wish it was a bit tighter. There are times when I feel like an attack should have hit but it doesn't even though the sword physically seems to penetrate the enemy. And then there are times when there's a large crowd of enemies where it's hard to tell what's going on, but it's not like unmanageable. Once I got the hang of it, I got pretty good at the combat and it started to feel really good and really fun. And then there is guns and traps. That's where I specialized in when I made the character. Now with guns and traps, there is a limited quantity of resources. So with guns, limited ammo, with traps, limited concoctions. But fortunately, you can either buy them or you can craft them, depending on which stats you invest in. So you gotta be mindful in terms of how much ammo or how many traps you have. And I will say that guns actually do feel very impactful when you hit enemies with them. There's just a sense of oomph behind each shot. And traps are really fun to play around with, lay them around, draw enemies in. And once you start combining all of that with sword play and kind of uh, getting craftier with combat, combat becomes really engaging. And then more recently, towards the latter hours, I began to delve into magic. And magic in this game is definitely more like Witcher than Skyrim. So in Skyrim, there's a wide array of magic spells that you accrue over time. Whereas in Witcher, there's a handful of spells that you already have, but you upgrade over time. And that's sort of the situation with Greedfall. You've got like standard magic missiles, there's like this stasis thing you can do to freeze enemies, there's like a shadow burst abilities, and there's a couple others. I didn't delve too much into magic because again my build was so focused on guns and traps, but the few occasions in which I got to use it, I found that mana regenerates over time, albeit kind of slowly. So you do want to invest in some kind of melee weapon, whether it be heavy blunt weapons or light swords. Those are infinite uses, those strikes you can always do, but ammo is limited, traps are limited, and then mana is limited, although it does regenerate. So if you find yourself in a situation where you run out of resources, the sword is the main go-to in order to 
attack enemies. Worth noting that there is a Dragon Age style tactical pause element to this combat system. At any point you can bring up this menu where you can issue any commands for the main character, whether it be basic actions like attacking and parrying and defending, whatever it is. And you can also from this menu use potions, lay traps, do basically anything your character can do, and it's a really neat feature, but I do feel as though it's wasted a bit and that you cannot control any of the companion characters with this tactical menu. There is absolutely no way to issue commands to your companions, which can be annoying because the AI is pretty dumb oftentimes. When I need healing, for example, the companion that can heal won't kind of look at my health and try to time the healing that way. She just kind of does it whenever she feels like it. But if the tactical menu had a way for me to command her when to heal, that would have been awesome. And same thing goes for other actions like attacking specific enemies or doing specific maneuvers at certain times. The tactical menu feels wasted in that regard, though it does have its uses when there's a frantic situation going on and you need to pause the game for a bit and think about what you want to do next. Though for the most part I never really used it all that much, I used it a couple times, I found that just kind of playing it like Witcher was perfectly serviceable. There isn't enough strategic elements in this game to make tactical menu, tactical pausing super useful like it would be in something like Dragon Age where there's a lot of strategy and tactics involved. I love the way you can reconfigure button inputs from this tactical pause menu and the way you can assign potions and techniques and skills and items to a wide variety of shortcuts, that's definitely a plus. But yeah, with all said and done, once you have all of these elements, the sword play, the magic, the traps and the gunplay, once you have all of that nailed down, there's a lot of things you can do in combat that make it feel engaging, that make it feel satisfying, especially when you pull off these really cool maneuvers and stunts. And what you can do in combat and outside of combat will obviously depend on the points you invest in, in terms of leveling up and character progression. There are three main categories you have to worry about, skills, attributes, and talents. So skills define your combat prowess in three subcategories, combat, technical, and magic. As you delve deeper into these trees, you'll unlock new abilities, or you'll get a significant damage boost. And each time you get a new skill, it really does feel significant. You can feel your character progressing every level with every skill you unlock. Then we have attributes, and depending on how many points you put into specific attributes, you'll be able to wield higher level weapons of specific types. So in my situation, I focused on swords, so that's agility, as well as guns, which is tied to accuracy. I focus specifically on those two in order to wield higher level swords, higher level guns, and to get a damage boost statistically along the way. Finally, there's talents comprised of charisma, lockpicking, craftsmanship, science, vigor, and intuition. All of these essentially allow you to take certain shortcuts or have certain conveniences as you explore the world or as you engage in quests. So with high lock picking and charisma, which is what I focused on, I could access chests and locked doors. I could access certain areas without a key. And with high charisma, I could talk my way out of certain situations, saved myself a lot of time and trouble for certain quests. Eventually, I put some points into science so I could craft my own ammo and alchemical traps. I also want to put some points into craftsmanship so I can craft my own weapon and armor upgrades without having to use a blacksmith. And I feel like every talent generally just is useful in some way. I feel like the game does a good job of making each talent useful by presenting a number of situations where all of them can be used in some way. Another form of character progression is of course the equipment that you find throughout the world, weapons, armor, and such. And I love their design. There's definitely a swashbuckler aesthetic to many of them. And there's just a lot of cool aesthetic elements that come with upgrades as well. There's a cool crafting system where where you can kind of swap out individual weapon components that give you statistical upgrades and give you some cool aesthetic changes as well. I did find that I didn't find as much armor and weapon loot as I should have in the world. A lot of the ones that I did find were kind of the same common kind of lower level stuff. A lot of the higher level loot I found were confined to vendors, but I feel like they should have given out more via, you know, quests, via the stuff you do in-game. I just felt like I've been using the same armor for a while, 
because I'm always waiting for the game to give me something so I don't have to spend all this money with vendors, but that didn't happen as often as I would have liked to. But that complaint aside though, I love the way the equipment system works in this game. I do wish that other cosmetic customization elements would have been more fleshed out. The character creator, for example, isn't very extensive. There are just a couple presets, a couple things you can select here and there, but I found that customization on that front was pretty lacking. And one little thing that I wish the game had as a feature was the ability to toggle off hats so I can get the advantage of wearing a hat or a helmet while still being able to see my character's head in its full glory without anything to cover it up. So with all the core elements of Greedfall out of the way, I'd like to now delve into some technical issues that this game suffers from. There is a lack of polish here, which is unfortunate. So there's plenty of bugs out there. Never found anything game-breaking, but there's a lot of stuff here that does break immersion, so you'll find plenty of occasions in which NPCs were stuck in a walking animation loop because they were stuck behind some object or were just walking towards a wall. There were situations in which NPCs were kind of floating in the air for no reason. And then one time the walls, the game world and the walls disappeared out of nowhere at certain camera angles. One time I saw this like weird like rift in space out of the blue, plenty of times NPCs, for some reason, their eyes were shut during dialogue conversations. Things would just randomly disappear in the middle of cutscenes. There were just plenty of weird stuff going around as far as cutscenes were concerned. There were also a lot of collision issues I found. One time I got kind of like stuck in this little ditch, like a little groove on the ground because the collision engine was kind of not up to par. A lot of invisible walls that I feel like shouldn't be there, so on and so forth. So really the game's greatest flaws are all technical, I feel. But even for all its flaws, Greedfall is truly an impressive game that pulls you in. And this is particularly impressive given that it comes from a smaller studio of, of like 30 or 40 people. It's very much like a double A RPG experience that sometimes teeters the line of triple A, but you can definitely feel the limitations in terms of the budget, the manpower. You can tell that they took a lot of shortcuts in various aspects to bring this game to life. You can definitely tell that there are a lot of elements that weren't as fully fleshed out as it could have. You can tell that there were technical limitations, the graphics aren't necessarily up to par, but amidst the rough edges, there's just a game with a lot of soul here. It reminds me a lot of when I play the first Mass Effect, or when I play the first Witcher. Like, you could tell these were kind of rough on a technical level, but there's something there, right? There's like a potential there, there's something soulful about that experience that made me go, this game needs a sequel, and if that sequel can flesh out what's a very solid foundation from a narrative and gameplay standpoint, this can eventually become a franchise that can be revered. There's also elements of Alpha Protocol to it, where Alpha Protocol is a super kind of rough buggy, technically not the best game, but there's something about Alpha Protocol that I love. It's like one of my favorite games for some reason, even though it's rough. And Greedfall has elements of that, where despite the rough edges, it's like one of the best games, one of the most enjoyable times I've had with a video game this year. The, the way it draws you in with its artistic design, the lore, the political intrigue, uh, some of the RPG elements, it, it all makes for a memorable game. And that to me is ultimately what matters. Oh, and did I mention this game is 50 bucks instead of the traditional 60? $10 cheaper than the cheapest standard version of your usual AAA game, so that's a nice little bonus. I just hope that Spiders can take the knowledge from developing this game and really craft like a Mass Effect 2 type of thing where they took the foundation and really took it from a good game with a lot of potential to a true masterpiece that people will remember for a long time. I think Greedfall has that potential as a game series, so I hope this game does well, but as this particular first entry into this franchise currently stands, it is a fairly good game that is too rough to reach the status of great, but is still somehow incredibly compelling to me, incredibly enjoyable, very memorable, I don't know, I, I just really like it. Now, if you're not entirely sure about this game, I recommend you check out other reviews as well to see where you might stand, because from what I've seen, this game has been getting 
good to mixed reviews. Some people didn't like it, others really loved it. I'm in the camp of really loving this game despite it definitely being rough. Um, so, you know, look into it more before you decide if this game is for you. All I'll say is that there is potential with this franchise. There's something here that that feels like it has to be nurtured. So there you have it, folks. I'd love to hear what your take is on this game based on what I said in this review or based on what you've played of the game in the comments below. With that, I would like to end this news update and discussion video. Thank you for tuning in. To be further updated on all things gaming news, reviews, and discussions, stay tuned right here on Yong Yeah. I'll see you guys next time. Yong out.